This documentary will look at the early Earth and how it formed, as well as the development of Earth's atmosphere and subsequent dawn of life right up until the Cambrian explosion. Today we will step back in time to explore theories explaining what created the spark for life on Earth. Each theory has its own unique ideas and ingredients to support how life first began. The earliest solid evidence of life lies in fossilised microbial structures called stromatolites, dated at 3.7 billion years old. During the Archean Aeon, the early Earth endured harsh conditions and heavy bombardments of meteor showers, which brought many important materials such as iron and water, and may have even sterilised some of the early attempts at life on Earth. The story of the evolution towards modern-day forests begins in the sea. Approximately 500 million years ago during the late Cambrian, a form of green algae was on its way to becoming the first plant to exploit Earth's untapped terrestrial environment. This invasion is thought to have occurred along low-lying coastal regions where algal mats containing these green algae were frequently exposed to atmospheric conditions due to large-scale tidal fluxes. Following this, approximately 35 million years later during the Mador Division, primitive non-vascular plants similar to liverworts and mosses were believed to have first appeared. These plants had no roots, no seeds and reproduced through simple dispersal of spores. These fossilised spores were used as markers for dating plant life through time. At the turn of the 20th century, a newly discovered site with excellent fossil preservation was discovered called the Burgess Shale high in the Rockies. A discovery was made that changed the way we thought about the evolution of complex organisms. This here is Morella. It displays all characteristics of modern arthropod groups. However, the rock that entombs it is half a billion years old. Arthropods share a number of characteristics. A hard chitinous exoskeleton, segmented bodies, flexible joints. Really basic one is a crab, crustaceans, the myriapod, centipedes. Turn over any stone, you would see these. Arthropod diversification really occurs in the middle Cambrian. We encounter animals such as Sanctocaris, Anomalocaris, and Morella. Anomalocaris, once an apex predator, ruled the seas. It had two grasping tusks at the front, which was used to seize prey. Two large complex eyes to view and then behind you have a segmented body with no limbs but it would have moved in a kind of a wave motion. Moving out of the camera and you see 
groups of arthropods such as the crustaceans and trilobites going on to the Ordovician. Numerous trilobite fossils found from this period suggesting the class is already quite diverse. Meanwhile on land, plants had flourished. With decaying material littering the near shore, the land was ripe for the taking. This was one small step for arthropods, one giant leap for evolution. Arthropods invaded the land in the late Cambrian and the first one to do so was called Eutycasinoids. They looked scorpion-like but weren't closely related at all. There's trace fossils found in Canada and the footprints were left in aeolian sediments. Arthropods were pre-adapted in that they had an exoskeleton that supported their weight on land, segmentation and internal gills. Their exoskeleton functions like a reverse scuba suit. Back in the sea, most of them were either detritus feeders or predators, and they remained like that because plant material was very difficult to break down. There was an explosion in arthropod diversity after they secured the land, and particularly the mouthpieces of arthropods developed very quickly to form for example, mandibles and venom fangs. Venom fangs would be present in today's centipedes and spiders. There have been many evolutionary milestones in the history of life. One that has had an extreme impact is that of the development of the jaw. Nowadays, having jaws allows carnivores and herbivores alike to consume a wider range of food to hunt larger prey, to graze on plants, and to pierce armour. History has let jaws diversify into a variety of forms. Some animals, like crocodiles, focused on their ability to put immense strength behind their bite, where others rely on versatility, having specific alterations to suit their lifestyle. You might associate jaws with teeth today, however the first jaws did not, in fact, possess them. Instead, they relied on the weight of their skull to present a tremendously powerful bite. The evolution of jaws and fish allowed them to dominate the food chain. The jaw first appeared during the Silurian period, approximately 430 million years ago. This innovation was crucial to their success in the Devonian, leading to the age of the fishes. Placodermy were one of the earliest predatorial jawed fish and are more commonly known as the armoured fish. One of the biggest members of this family was known as Dunkleosteus a six metre monster that hunted in the shallow oceans with a bite force of roughly 41,000 pounds. Instead of using teeth, it used razor sharp bones extending from the skull that closed on prey in a scissor-like motion. This top predator had evolved powerful biting action, allowing it to excel as an apex predator. But what it had in power, it lacked in efficiency. This jaw expended a lot of energy due to its weight and size. While it was a notable beginning, new innovations were yet to come after animals conquered the land. Over 380 million years ago, complex life on planet Earth was mainly found in the oceans. At this time, terrestrial life was comprised of plants and arthropods. Conditions remained this way until some intrepid species took their first steps onto land. The footsteps these species created represented a landward journey the likes of which the planet had never seen before. This journey continues today. So, what do we know about these creatures? We know that they were originally confined to the oceans, with fins and gills similar to modern fish. Gradually, over the course of millions of years, species became specialised to survive in environments such as rivers. During this transformation, their limbs became stronger and more rigid, a development necessary to support their weight in shallow conditions. These newly evolved species, known as tetrapods, are defined by their four limbs, multiple digits and their solid vertebrae. Finally, for reasons that are not fully understood, these creatures made a crucial step that would affect the destiny of all future land-based life. Ireland's rich fossil record provides us with a unique window into the past. These remarkably preserved trace fossils represent evidence of maybe not the first steps, 
but certainly steps created by creatures that existed here over 380 million years ago. But in order for us to explore these steps further, we need to take a trip. Today we are standing along the rugged coastline of the Atlantic Ocean but if we were to go back 380 million years you would see that we are standing on a floodplain somewhere in the tropics. Thanks to a series of random events the tetrapod tracks here in Valencia Island have been preserved. Prior to the formation of the trackways a huge mountain range called the Caladonite spread across this entire area. These peaks covered a stretch of land that extended from modern day Scotland to the Americas. From these mountains, large volumes of water flowed, creating rivers that carried huge amounts of sediment, which would eventually be deposited in rivers and vast floodplains. It was in these sediments that the movements of creatures living at the time would be memorialized. In some trackways, for example Duhilla here on Valencia, marks left by the dragging of the creature's tail and abdomen showed that they were walking and not swimming, in contrast to some early theories. Perfectly preserved ripples also showed that these creatures inhabited what was once a riverbed. This is Wally the Terror Bird, and we're going to tell his story. Our story begins 62 million years ago on the island continent of South America. The KT extinction event has occurred 3 million years prior, and all of the dinosaurs have disappeared, leaving a void for new apex predators on Earth. Due to the continent's isolation, evolution took a different route, allowing terror birds to dominate. So what made them so special? Terror birds belong to family Phororacidae. These carnivorous birds evolved into 25 species throughout their time. These bipedal and flightless birds had long legs, long necks and big heads which supported long hooked beaks used for tearing flesh. They were the largest carnivorous birds ever recorded and were found all over South America, with fossils mostly found in Patagonia and Argentina. The evolutionary history of humans can be illustrated on a tree. Branches that don't reach the top represent extinct failed species of hominin, while other branches represent species which flourished and eventually evolved into the present day modern human. Diet has long been implicated as a driving force in human evolution. Changes in the type of food consumed and the manner in which it was procured have been linked to an increased brain power and the emergence of bipedalism. With this in mind, we begin our investigation around 4.4 million years ago, with the first known hominin from fossil records, and debatably the last common ancestor of both primates and man, Ardipithecus ramidus. Ramidus exhibits similar morphological features to the modern chimp, such as long curving fingers, which, when combined with its more rigid legs and feet, suggests it was a both a specialised tree climber and could also walk upright. Studies of tooth microwear done by a team of scientists led by Professor White of the University of California suggest they ate large amounts of fruit, nuts and leaves. Furthermore, stable carbon isotopes suggest that they ate woodland rather than grassland plants, which indicates that they resided in and therefore evolved from a forest environment. Homo neanderthalensis made and used a diverse set of sophisticated tools, controlled fire, lived in shelters, were skilled hunters of large animals and also ate plant food. One of the most important Neanderthal sites in northwest Europe is known as Le Cot de saint Berlad. At this time, the climate became colder and the landscape became more favourable and fertile for herd animals. The excavation site was found to have large piles of mammoth bones, which appeared to have been intentionally stampeded over the cliff. And butchered. This had never been done before. Through the culmination of innovations achieved by our ancestors, in order to procure food and avail of any and every possible food source, we have moved from a primitive live fast and die young strategy to a live slow and grow old strategy. This has undoubtedly helped make humans one of the most successful organisms on the planet today. As I say, Watson, the fossil record is incomplete, but geology is not our only tool. Indeed, genetics, phylogeny, chemistry and more have all played a part in our understanding of animal evolution. 
We have enough evidence to put together a timeline and to consider several hypotheses. Yet I am still at a loss for an answer to where the fossils are. <laughs> Seems to me the great Sherlock Bones is in a jam with this one. <laughs> jam. Jam. Yes, Watson, that's it! What on earth, Bones? Preservation, that's the key! It's been staring me in the face this whole time! The stem groups, the basal animals, they could only leave trace fossils, or perhaps none at all! The conditions were not suitable to preserve the organisms themselves. Well, bless my bones, you are a wonder! Paleontology, my dear Watson.